Back at it again, baby, and we got another one with the brother Thomas Soul. Let's dive in. Do you miss teaching at all? Yes and no. Uh, teaching as it is today, no. Uh, teaching as it was when I started out in 1962 at a little college in New Jersey, I really loved it. I mean, uh, uh, the uh, when I taught my last class at the end of the week, I would be looking for looking forward to the next class the following uh, Monday. Over the years, the academic world changed drastically. Uh, and uh, now when I got the offer from the Hoover Institution, which, which involved no teaching at all, I said, this is it. It's sad in a sense. There, there are many people out there who may well have wanted to teach, but the conditions of teaching at many universities became such that it was, it was just not worth the bother. What's one of those conditions that changed that uh, turned you off from teaching? I think the attitude of the uh, students the students, the faculty, and the administration, uh, which doesn't leave much else. <laughs> uh, the, the, the students uh, really uh, began to think uh, that, uh, that if they showed up for class, that, that a B was like a constitutional right. Yeah. Hey, showing up is half the battle. I will say that. You know, you, you find in a lot of situations and circumstances, just showing up is, is, is half the battle in and of itself. But... You also got to put in the work. You can't you can't just show up and, and walk in and just look around and expect, you know, results to happen. You you, you also have to put in the work uh, uh, along with that. So I would get students who could come to me at the beginning of the class and say, you know, I'm a graduating senior. And I said, you believe in predestination. Uh, I, 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 but they thought it was my responsibility to see that they graduated. Uh, I never took that view. So academia. There's a kind of there's a corrupting influence here. They get money to a large extent from government, all the student loans. Well, all of it with this government is redistributing income from ordinary working Joes to fancy professors, fundamentally is what's going on and has been going on for decades. Correct? Yeah, and, and, and of course to the students. And to the students. Who, who, who riot when, 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 when not enough of the taxpayers' money is, is given to them. Has academia in America become, I don't even know quite how to ask the question, has it become more irresponsible? Did it reach a low point in the 60s and it's been recovering since? How do you think of it in those terms? Over, well, I, th I, I, I think it, it was a break point in the 60s. Uh, I'm not sure it's recovered. I know in the 70s there was a lot of self-congratulation that we no longer have violence on campus. Uh, yes, the campus was, was, was quiet, but it was the quiet of surrender mm -hmm. because people who would uh, cause people to riot were not invited on campus. People who would antagonize the students by their viewpoints were not hired as professors. One of the reasons uh, why a few years ago when uh, the think tanks of the world were ranked, and I, Hoover was ranked number one, but most of the leading think tanks uh, and those rankings were conservative think tanks. And I think there's a very simple reason for it. The kinds of uh, top scholars who would normally... What is a think tank? Let me know in the comment section, please. I would look it up, but, you know, my, my, my hands are a little... Are a little fool. I think there's a very simple reason for it. The kinds of uh, top scholars who would normally be in academia were not in academia, and this is one of the places they could go and work uh, with the kind of freedom that academic uh, tenure is supposed to provide, but doesn't. I mean, I've advised some young people uh, do not go into, t into t teaching in public schools because uh, uh, the odds are so stacked against you, and people can write bad references from you for you. When, especially when you're young and, and, you, and what they say about you is all that the, someone sees. Now, by the time I was uh, teaching at some of these schools, I remember one place where the, the department chairman used to uh, threaten one of my, my colleagues that he wouldn't write good references for him. I had, I, I had uh, you know, I'd, I'd published stuff while I was still in graduate school. I had Milton Friedman and uh, George Stigler to write references for me. What this guy said there as chair, chairman of the department wouldn't, wouldn't matter a bit. But but most people don't don't have that uh, situation, no. and so you you have to pick your you have to pick your fights. The no child left behind thing, with Bush. Mm -hmm. There are kids who go to school to raise hell, and a, and a handful of those can prevent the whole class from learning anything. Now, the logical thing with we all knew a class clown, and some sometimes some of them weren't like super disruptive, but they were just goofy. And, you know, a little bit funny here and there, you know, and, and wouldn't push it beyond that point. But then we all knew that one kid who just would go above and beyond. 
or a couple of those kids who would just go above and beyond and yeah it, it would turn into this huge ordeal and get out of the classroom go to the office type situation and it was a whole mess and um yeah definitely did disrupt uh the learning environment and i'm sure it kind of shook the teachers up a little bit you know going through that and then trying to calm yourself back down to re-engage with the rest of the class without that elevated level anymore you know because obviously you don't want to take it out on the rest of the students yeah you're angry at the one student but you got to bring yourself back down refocus and get back to the task at hand so yeah he's right about that to be to separate from learning anything now the logical thing would be to separate those kids out uh and let the ones who want to learn something learn something you yeah. can't do that because the ideology says no and so and so you sacrifice whole generations of poor and minority kids for this ideology and this utopian notion. Yeah, and, and we end up in an odd dystopia probably. Yeah, and Milton Friedman used to say, uh, the best is the enemy of the good. Yeah. And of course, it would be better if everybody could be educated at the same time. It can't be done. Mm. That is true. And also, people learn in different ways. So, I mean, maybe you should separate it that way. Certain classes where there's more one-on-one -on -one attention, you know, smaller classrooms instead of the big giant classrooms with 30, 40 people in one class. Y'all let me know. For my teachers out there, what, what do y'all think the best, uh, the best avenue would be? We're raising whole generations uh, who, 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 who regard facts as more or less optional. Um, you have kids. Ooh, I'm, I, I, I got to stop it on that. Ooh. Yes. I think I said this in a earlier video, but I need to make a t-shirt that puts that on display. Facts matter or something like that. Because he's, he's right. There's a huge portion of people who don't care about the facts, the fact of the situation. And all they care about is their feelings. You could provide them with all the facts you want. You, you could provide them with statistic after statistic, study after study, and it does not matter. And it's just like, uh, oh. What? In the, in the in elementary school who are being urged to take stands on political issues, to write letters to congressmen and presidents about nuclear energy, political issues. In elementary school who are being urged to take stands on political issues, to write letters to congressmen and presidents about nuclear energy. You know, you know they're not, even, not a decade old. And they're, and they're being thrown these kinds of questions that could uh, absorb the lifetime of a very brilliant and learned man. Uh, and they're, and they're, they're being taught that it's important to have views. And they're not being taught that it's important to know what you're talking about. It's important to hear the opposite viewpoint. And more important, to learn how to distinguish whether, why viewpoint A and viewpoint B are different and which one has the most evidence or logic behind it. They disregard that. They hear something and they hear some rhetoric and they run with it. Absolutely. It's important to hear both viewpoints in a situation and determine which viewpoint has the most logic and facts to back it. Facts matter. I might even go as far as saying your feelings don't. I love that he said that right, said, said that right there at the end. 100% true. Another great one from the brother Thomas Soul, man. But as always, y'all let me know what you thought about it in the comment section below. Like, share, comment, and of course, hit that subscribe button before you go. Peace and love. I'm out.